This is Matt Lees, and I got a question, please. Uh, yeah, Dark Souls 2 reviews, are they worth worrying about? Now, I'm not talking about the kind of worry about, you know, worrying about the police finding what you've got underneath your patio and that cavity underneath your house. I'm talking about the kind of worry of when the reviews actually come out. Are you going to, you know, really care about what they say that much? Now, some of the points here are going to be quite general. You know, some of them are going to be about reviews in general, the way they work, why they don't work sometimes. Uh, but others are going to be very specific to this game and this series. So, you know, bear with me here. First of all, I'm just going to talk about the nature of reviews, of course. Now, a lot of the time with reviews, it's all about fitting the publication and fitting that publication's audience. Now... That's fine if you're part of the audience, but obviously when review scores come out, sometimes people go, what, they've given it that score? That doesn't sound right. Well, it might not sound right to us, but obviously they're not really providing that number for the internet at large. They're providing that number as part of review for their audience. This might sound like teaching your grandma to suck eggs, but a lot of the time people don't think about that. They go, an eight? What? When actually it's not about us, it's about that audience. If that audience is you, fair enough, take note. But if it's just a website you've never heard of or a website you don't like or don't visit, don't sweat it. So with Dark Souls in particular, I kind of feel like a lot of places reviewing the game will be reviewing it on a kind of criteria that maybe isn't specific enough to be of interest to me. You know, they're going to be reviewing Dark Souls 2 and asking the question, is it a good RPG? You know, is it a good action game? And for me, that's that's not even nearly enough, frankly. And, and if you're watching this, then you may be in the same boat. And also, you know, it's important to note that often, you know, people think that reviews they don't agree with are not useful. And that's a really bad way to look at things. Knowing the reviewer, understanding where they're coming from can be incredibly useful, even if you don't agree what, with the sentiment of what they're saying. So if you're reading a review and... Very often I've read reviews that have actually been negative about a game, but based on what they've said, I kind of think, hey, I'm going to like this game. This game sounds like it's up my street. And that doesn't mean that review is wrong, of course, or bad. It's just not the same opinion as yours. It doesn't mean it's not useful. However, major sites do tend to grind away personality from reviews, aiming for that kind of objective thing, you know. You end up with a feature list that almost gives no insight into the heart of a game, what a game is really about. You get these kind of glorified previews with a number at the end. And I mean, I'm not going to name names here because it's quite obvious which sites these sites are, but I know of a few big sites that, that actually purposefully make sure that reviews are edited by multiple people, really taking away that individual perspective. And you know what? A lot of fans say they want that. A lot of people say that... The, the, the reviews have too much of a personality or a review in it, and they want something more objective. And of course that's a really stupid approach, because an objective review is of no use to anyone. You're better off having a very subjective review, so you can basically get an idea of where that person's coming from, and then decide whether or not their opinions are really relevant to you. Now the whole situation with review scores and all that stuff, in this case, especially, I feel, the number doesn't really matter to me, and the fact that all the info I really want to know about Dark Souls 2 relates to tonality, ideas, details, you know? Review scores have a tendency to be overly swayed by skin-deep details, you know? It's very rare that you see the really interesting games that are really rough around the edge score well, and that's because a lot of the time, whilst reviewers will fall in love for a game for having incredible ideas or incredibly interesting attempts to do things, if then it's an ugly mess that doesn't work properly, they're going to give it a lower score. And it does tend to be that the more polished, more kind of complete and very clean games, you find generally reviewers will feel compelled to give those games very high scores because it just it feels somehow wrong not to. You kind of think, well, everything's so nice that it kind of means that often I find the most exciting games don't tend to score as well as, say, some stuff that's a bit more dull. Again, that's another bigger issue for another time, though. On a basic level, though, I think my issue with the reviews for Dark Souls 2 is there's only a handful of traditional games writers who I really trust to understand the core of Dark Souls enough to properly review Dark Souls 2. And I say this from, properly reviewed from the perspective of a fan who really wants to know, you know, is it as good as Dark Souls? Is it as good as Demon's Souls? And as far as I know, most of the writers that I really trust aren't reviewing it for various reasons. Um, and this isn't to say that other people reviewing the game are bad or not good reviewers, just they're unlikely to review the game with the approach and level of detail that I'm specifically interested in. 
And, you know, this is kind of the tough nature of being a games reviewer. You kind of have to be a bit of a jack of all trades. You do tend to get specialists, but generally speaking, you don't have the time as a games reviewer to invest tons of time into just one game to really understand it and get to the core of it. Dark Souls is different, and there are a handful of journalists who've done that just because they love it. But, um, generally speaking, you know, people have stacks of stuff to get through, and they'll play Dark Souls 2 like any other RPG, and they'll review it from the perspective of it being an RPG. And that's fine, but it's not of any use to me. However, there is also a tendency for a human trait to slide in here and cause trouble, and that's to do with being cool. There's this tendency for sequels of cult games to be reviewed in an odd way, you know? This probably happened to a degree with Demon's Souls, but I expect due to the larger amount of hype um, and kind of weight behind Dark Souls 2 that the effect will be larger this time. And what I'm talking about here is I'm talking based on experience from the past and looking at trends, but I suspect that there will be a lot of reviewers who missed their chance to ride the wave last time around when Dark Souls was a big thing and everyone was suddenly going, Oh my god, Dark Souls! And I suspect that these people will A, be more eager to whip out the surfboard this time, and B, be more overly cautious about slagging the game off in case there's a chance they somehow don't get it. There's this feeling that I get the impression that a lot of people who maybe like Dark Souls but don't really 100% get it and haven't played it enough to really get it um, will be talking about these reviews like it's Dark Souls. And you see this a lot actually. If you go and read um, a lot of early reviews for sequels a lot of the time, if you read through that review, often they read like a review of the first game. And it's a, it's a weird thing. And I've talked about this with a bunch of journalist friends of mine who've have also noticed it, but it is almost this tendency, it's like, if you didn't get to to play the first game, then you end up reviewing the second game, in a sense, as if it's the first one? I guess in the same way that people will go to a gig of a band that aren't as big anymore, and they'll be like, oh, it was amazing, and they kind of, they want to have the experience that other people have had, and to, to say they've had that experience. Anyway, this isn't something that I think people do implicitly. I think it's just a human thing about not wanting to appear to be behind or missing something or missing out on something cool or not understanding something that's cool. And you know, there's a good example of this sort of stuff happening um, because there's a problem with the fact that if you do stand up and say, you know what, I think this game isn't very good um, and you don't kind of get it, you maybe feel like you don't get something but you decide that that doesn't matter because you don't like it. And this happened actually with From Software's Armored Core a couple of years ago. It sparked off a bit of an outrage when reviewers came away from it and said it was a bit crap. And some people got attacked a lot for this. And I was actually, I didn't get attacked for this, but I was one of the people who played, I think it was Armored Core for Honor for something. Anyway, I played it and I thought it was pretty crap. And I appreciated that there was maybe some things about it I didn't understand. And I was appreciated that there was some depth to it that I didn't get. But I kind of also thought, no, I, you know, there's a degree to which I shouldn't have to work because it's hard to understand stuff. And I found it obtuse. And I didn't think it was very good. I didn't think it was very fun. And also, as I said earlier, I was reviewing for a publication. I was reviewing at that point for Official Xbox Magazine, which is quite a mainstream magazine. A lot of the people who read this stuff are not super hardcore gamers. So I reviewed it for that audience. But the thing is, you know, a lot of people then said, we didn't get it. And there was this outrage from fans saying, you didn't understand it. You haven't understood the game. This is a bad review because you haven't got it. And, you know, this remains an issue. And I kind of feel like with Dark Souls 2, the f I don't think, even if you get people playing it and they kind of maybe don't get it and think it's not that good, I suspect you'll get a lot of reviewers who will be on the fence but will end up erring on caution and giving it quite a high score and just saying, oh, it's a really hard but rewarding RPG um, just because they will be worried that they're going to get absolutely shat on if they have got it wrong, or are perceived to get it wrong. I mean, it's an interesting phenomenon, it happens with lots of games, but I really think with this game, it's kind of a big deal. Because most obviously there are, there are easy targets. Like, there are some easy targets to kick in the teeth without having to be worried about it. I mean, the most obvious one is probably Dynasty Warriors games, uh, which, you know, if you don't like Dynasty Warriors, you will get Dynasty Warriors fans saying you don't get it, but most other people won't care. Um, personally, I'm kind of on the fence with them. I kind of think they're fun, but also they are quite bad as well in some regards. Anyway, but Dark Souls 2 at the moment, 
already feels like quite the golden cow. You know, it feels like if you're going to touch it, then you've got to be really sure you know what you're doing. And quite a few fans became really aggravated when I expressed concerns about Dark Souls 2 in the massive preview video I produced just before I left Video Gamer. And these were measured concerns. You know, they were concerns based on a solid understanding of the previous games and a good understanding of how the sequel seemed to be changing things. And I just, you know, expressing some concerns as a fan, people really didn't like that. So I've got to make clear, it's not a case here of saying that reviewers will be scared of pissing off angered fans. But they're likely to be reticent of giving out low scores unless they're absolutely sure that they haven't missed something, they haven't got something wrong. And with a series as obtuse as this, putting the boot in based on gut feelings is the sort of move that's going to take serious balls. I mean, I remember getting a ton of grief for reviewing Virtua Tennis 4 and giving it a higher score than I gave Top Spin 3. Now, this was when I was OXM. I don't know anything about tennis. And, you know, you have to go with your gut. And actually, to this day, I still think that Virtua Tennis 4 was much more fun. But fans of tennis games, my god, really, really went for me. And obviously, it's a difficult situation. You have to trust your gut in this situation. But also, if you're not sure, then it gets scary. So, of course, for these reasons, I kind of feel that maybe a lot of the people who are going to be reviewing uh, Dark Souls 2 games reviewers, maybe, you know, because of the nature of their job and the scope of their job and having to review a really wide uh, number of games for a wide audience, maybe aren't going to give it the kind of specialist, detailed approach that it needs. However, on the other side of the spectrum, you've got people like Dark Souls YouTubers. And they've got, you know, incredible amount of knowledge about the game. So in some regards, you kind of think, well, those guys are going to be the ones who are going to have the reviews that are going to be worth caring about and worth, you know, giving a damn about. Well, yes and no. I mean, the problem here is a lot of these guys are almost too blinded by their sheer obsession with the game. Much like the fans who get aggressive when you point out things that might be bad about the sequel, they may be too much in love with the franchise to be able to critically look at it from that perspective. You know, they almost want it to be good and want it to be a great game so much that they're very likely to to forgive lots of things that perhaps traditional critics wouldn't. And also, you know, Namco have worked with a couple of the big Dark Souls YouTube guys. You know, they've, they've kind of had slight collaborations. They've done stuff with them. They've One of the guys has been involved in writing the official guide. And a lot of people don't see anything wrong with that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it's going to affect the nature and the tone of how you talk about the game, initially at first anyway. You know, after a while it may change and you may start to be more honest, but initially it is going to change the tone of what you're saying. And some people will say, no, just because you're working a bit with Namco it doesn't mean they've bought you out, and I'm not saying that's it at all. There's a thing, one of the bits of experience about being a games journalist that I think people don't really appreciate and don't really understand, and probably the most difficult part of the job, is, is that you become steeled to this stuff. Um, you kind of have to go out. You have to go and spend time with not just the PRs, but with the developers. You spend time, you'll have dinner with some of the guys who are making the game. They'll tell you about their project. They'll tell you about how much they love it. They will really often pour out their hearts to you about how much this project is important to them, how much this game is important to them. And you have to be nice and genuine with these people and friendly with these people. And then you have to go home and you have to go back to your office and you have to write up saying, this game is shit. And that's actually quite difficult, especially knowing that you might then see these people again. Because most people are professionals and they understand the way it works and they won't take it personally. But every now and then there are people who do. And they feel like you've somehow betrayed them. But by spending time with these people and by being nice to them because you have to as part of your job, then going away and writing something bad about their game, a lot of people take that badly. And you know, at first it's a difficult situation because you sort of feel like, well, uh, and you're not necessarily going to say, this game's great, I love this game because you like these people, but if you feel it's bad, you're probably less likely to completely speak your mind because of that. And we kind of saw this recently with, um, uh, you know, with a YouTuber Francis um, uh, Boogie, who basically obviously had, uh, you know, the Major Nelson come around and visit him in his house and then afterwards was a lot more temp and a lot more reasonable and nice about the Xbox One. And I don't know whether that was part of a marketing deal with Xbox One, that the whole thing was there, but generally speaking, that is the way it works. And that's the reason that PR like to work with journalists and like to have them come into events because by keeping things a bit personal and personable, it 
takes the edge off, and it means that perhaps in the past Boogie would have been shouting and saying horrible things about Major Nelson, but once you've met somebody and you've shaken their hand and you've sat next to them in a room, it's very difficult to then um, aggressively attack um, their decisions and attack their, their business choices. And that's something that uh, not all journalists do well, but it's something that's definitely a skill. Knowing that you're going to piss people off, but having to do it because you've got to service your audience is an important part of being a journalist. And it's something that I think a lot of YouTubers don't really appreciate because they don't see the grey area of that kind of corruption. They see it as black and white and go, well, I'm not doing anything explicitly wrong. Well, they don't realise actually you are, you'll be influenced by these things. They will take your teeth out just by being nice to you. And uh, that's something I don't trust a lot of YouTubers to really understand and really account for yet because they're so fresh to it all that in their mind it's just, oh, you know, the guys are really nice. The guys from Namco have been really nice. It's like, yeah, well, that's great, but it's going to change things. It's going to change things slightly until you're strong enough to know that it won't. And I mean, also, the other problem that especially faces YouTubers who focus on one game like this is it's not just that they know they'll piss off the PRs and developers they'll piss off their audience. Their entire audience is built around the love for a franchise. You know, it's all the Dark Souls YouTubers. If they came out and said Dark Souls 2, not very good, they'd probably end up alienating their audience, both in the short term, in terms of people going, fuck you, it looks amazing, fuck you, but also their long term. You know, they, they make their money by making games about the Dark Souls series. If they then lose their audience because they say that the new game isn't very good, then they're, they're kind of shooting themselves in the feet. So their like livelihood is more dependent on on kind of keeping it going, keeping along, and not not saying you know this is a bit weak. So you know I'm not saying that they're not trustworthy for that reason, but it's difficult. And them having this refined audience, you know, it's like it's like having ten thousand people turn up to a gig, and then you getting up on stage and deciding to say actually no music shit. You're gonna piss your fan base off, and that's something that these guys must know. So it's gonna affect things. And this is partly a result of gaming audiences becoming weirdly partisan. You know. You can't be a fan of something and criticise it these days. It's As soon as you start to be critical about something, you're obviously not a fan. And it's an incredibly stupid mentality to have, because as fans, we should be the ones most fervently holding the stuff we love to task, because no one else understands it enough to properly do that. You know, other people are just going to be taking pot shots and being snarky. We understand it, which means we're the ones that have to point things out when it's not good. But all of this stuff I've said is kind of about reviews generally. I think it's more amplified for Dark Souls 2 because of the the intensity of the passion for this series and the complexity and obtusity of the game. I think these are factors that always play a part with any review kind of cycle or of any review period. But in this case, I think it's going to be amplified and I think we're going to see it really, these effects more often, more heavily than we should usually. But there's another factor which is very specific to Dark Souls, and this is possibly the most important factor about why I'm not really too interested in the reviews, is the fact that the game that people are currently reviewing might not be the same game we actually play. And now to understand this, you've got to go right back to Dark Souls and the period where people were reviewing Dark Souls before it came out. I was one of those people, and when I was reviewing Dark Souls, it was tough as nails, you know? I was using debug code, there was no online infrastructure at all. Now that meant, like, you know, there were no handy messages telling you not to go there, or there were secrets here. There was nothing. It was like playing Dark Souls completely offline, no help. No nothing, no game facts, or you know, not game facts, no one uses that anymore. All we had was something called the Chain of Pain. And if you want to read that, actually, if you Google Chain of Pain OXM, I think it was a, a write-up of some of the, the email chain we had, actually, was turned into an article by Jason Killingsworth. And it was basically this email chain between journalists playing the game talking about how we were getting on. Because the only people we had to help us were other journalists. So we were sharing information. It was kind of exciting because it was like a, a microcosm of the way Dark Souls works. But it was incredibly difficult. We were trying to trying to get through the game without any resources. And it wasn't just that. It was the fact that there were so many other changes that happened later. The game was so much easier about a month after launch than it was when we were playing it. And 
it's difficult. I mean, my review very heavily emphasised the fact that it was a difficult, hard game. And that's because it bloody was. I mean, the game you play now, if you go and play Dark Souls, it's not the same game. It's a much easier game. You know, they increased the humanity drop rate. And humanity was, like, incredibly rare. And you had to be very careful about which bonfires you used it on and when you used it. But then they increased the drop rate from 10 to 210. So it made sure that, basically, humanity wasn't a problem anymore. You could just find it. And then they changed the overall kind of increase in the number of souls you gained from killing enemies to like 2 to 2.5 times more. So, you know, it's a massive increase in the number of souls you actually get from killing enemies. And even stuff like the fact that the online component just didn't work. We couldn't do any of that stuff. There was no summoning, there was no help. It was a nightmare. It was trying to, like, trying to decipher a code without any kind of key or legend and there were huge pieces of the puzzle missing. I mean, online now, in retrospect, it seems crazy because online is such a huge part of Dark Souls, you know? It's, when you say Dark Souls to people, the online component and the co-op and the PvP, it's so vital. When I reviewed that game, I knew vaguely what all that stuff entailed, but not really, you know? All of the interesting stuff to do with the Covenants, I didn't have a clue. We didn't get sent a manual, and the game is just fucking doesn't tell you anything about that stuff. So it was all just kind of guesswork. And I mean, this is a problem that you have with most games that have online elements, but most games with online elements of this era used to just say, hey, we didn't review the multiplayer mode, you know? You just say in the review, we didn't get a chance to review the multiplayer. And that's fairly standard because there's, you know, a lot of PRs don't organise this stuff. A lot of uh, publishers just don't work out a way for the online to work properly. But with something like this, it's so intrinsic. You know, the multiplayer and the online stuff, so intrinsic to Dark Souls. To be blunt, there was just this huge capacity with Dark Souls for reviewers to get it wrong. You know, to get just get it really wrong and not get what the game was about. And you know what? I lucked out, you know? I gave the game a 9 out of 10. And I lucked out because so much of that score that I gave that game was based on faith. It was based on having an understanding of what the game would be like when it was out in the wild. And trusting it that it would be as I imagined and you know what I was right but I could have easily been wrong and I actually came very close to giving Dark Souls a 6 out of 10 because pre-launch when you played it on your own it was hell it was hell and that's why so many reviewers made a big deal of the difficulty at the time you know because playing on your own offline with before the patch that made everything easier it was one of the most hellishly hard and brutal games I've ever played but now you know, years later, we realise that there's so much more to it than that. To just describe Dark Souls as a difficult game is really missing the point about what it's about. Um, which means that, you know, A, it means that if reviewers are banging on about how tough Dark Souls is and how it's a really hard game, and if all the reviews are going, oh, it's such a hard game, A, they're missing the point, because that's not, like, what we celebrate about Dark Souls. You know, you know we've played it enough now, we understand it enough to go, that's not why it's interesting. And also, if they're playing through it now and they're not having a hellish time without any help from the internet or without any help from other people, then I'm worried about the difficulty of this game because, frankly, you know, if it's if it's not impossibly hard when you're doing it without any of the help that we didn't have, then maybe it's not very hard. Anyway, it's very difficult. And, you know, this kind of faith in games is very common when reviewing. You have to trust your gut. When you're playing debug code, it's often very choppy. Online modes are very rarely demoed properly by PR. I mean, increasingly what they'll do is they'll say, hey, we've organized a demo session so you can play through the cart with a developer. I mean, that's awkward as fuck. That's like an estate agent offering to come and spend a few days living with you in a house so you can get a proper feel for it. You know, it's like, I appreciate that they mean well, but generally speaking, most of the time publishers are just trying to squeeze in a final developer demo to ensure that you definitely get the game in the degree that they want you to. And it's all a bit condescending and it's all a bit weak. But you do have to trust your gut. And I mean, I remember when I played Dragon's Dogma at OXM, that game ran like shit on debug. It was choppy as hell, the frame rate was crap, there was loads of screen tearing. And, you know, with the notes I got with it, it said obviously there are issues because it's debug code. And, you know, you always get this. And in that regard, I kind of did mention the review. It's really choppy, but hopefully it'll be better. When it launched, it wasn't. I mean, it was still a great game. I still love Dragon's Dogma. But, you know, when you're reviewing something, you kind of have to 
take into account the fact that you're not ever quite reviewing the finished product. And sometimes you are, but publishers will always tell you that you're not. Publishers will always tell you that obviously there's bugs and tweaks and stuff will be changed. And a lot of the time you can't trust them, but you can't outwardly say or expect that they're lying either. So it puts you in a very difficult position. Anyway, basically, I guess a lot of this stuff is stuff that is related to reviews generally, but with this one, it's just, it's very wise to retain a healthy sense of skepticism about the reviews that appear over the next week. And, you know, as I said, a lot of this vid replies to lots of review stuff in general, the way that the process works is often a bit flawed, but Dark Souls 2 feels like the perfect storm for a lot of these problems. You know, super specialists are going to get blinded by love, less savvy reviewers are going to do their best to either serve the needs of a wider audience, which isn't a bad thing, it's just them doing their job, or, you know, you're going to get some people who are trying to serve the needs of a hardcore fans, and they're going to be doing that in a fashion that, to be blunt, they simply aren't equipped to do so, you know? I think there's going to be a lot of cringeworthy reviews from people who've maybe play Dark Souls a bit and they kind of go, yeah, this is great, it's a tough sequel, it's got more levels, it's got more areas, and they're just not going to get it. And you know what, those reviews are going to be a bit pointless. And finally, you know, there's a pretty good chance that the game that these guys are all playing right now will not be the same game that we play on launch day, and will not be the same game that we play next month. You know, it's very likely that when it's out in the wild, From Software are a small studio, and I'd be very surprised if after it's been out for a few weeks, they don't end up dramatically tweaking some stuff to make it work better, because that's exactly what they did with Dark Souls. So, if any review pops out before launch claiming Dark Souls 2 is the best game in the series, it's flagrantly talking right out of its arse. Um, because, frankly, we're not going to know exactly how good Dark Souls 2 is, probably until the start of April, at least. So, yeah, I'll probably have my review ready by about then. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this ramble, mainly about reviews rather than Dark Souls, but I think it's fair to say that in this case, it's worth taking all of these things with a big pinch of salt. And is it worth really worrying about the reviews? Well, I'd probably say in this case, no. Anyway, thanks very much for watching. Bye! <laughs>